welcome to this second session that we're going to have on uh, war fighting on the future battlefields. And as a topic, as a title, it poses in itself two key questions. The first being, what is war fighting? And the second part of, what are future battlefields? Do they even exist physically or virtually, or where are they? And there are clear differences, intellectual differences, in each of these two questions. I mean, it's a polarizing discussion in many ways. On the one hand, you have those that say the future is full of radical change. We're in a place that we've never seen before. We're in a future that is changing more rapidly and faster than we've ever seen, and that events and mostly technology is taking us in a completely new direction. The idea is that AI, quantum, cyber, information, space, bio, nano, are going to push us in a radical transformation, a revolutionary uh, a, a part, an inflection point, a moment in which everything we know about the military will change forever. And then you have the school, the sort of Colin Gray school, that says, Do you know, this is part of an enduring program. It's an enduring evolution. As CGS says, you know, soldiering has been always about change and evolution. And this, according to Colin Gray school, is a long process. It's something that we see taking generations, not with the immediacy that some describe it as. And the younger generations, brilliantly, are really engaged in this. You just have to read the stuff in the Wavell Room or the Puzzle Palace. You see that people are genuinely engaged in this conversation, which is helpful. There's a young major called Amos Fox in the U.S. Army who describes the moment now as the fight for the soul of the Western military. And it's happening mostly with armies. It's not happening with navies and air forces who have an intellectual connection with technology and with platforms rather than the idea of soldiering, this need, as uh, General Mark said this morning, to get up and walk towards the enemy, to hold, take and resist the enemy on ground. So whilst we have those questions, we also have, and we might touch on it now or in questions, the idea that there is a climate security question which might be one of those things that is a future battlefield. How should we consider that? Now, we've been thinking about climate security and climate change in military operations for well over 10 years. We've been thinking about these four big questions. How we're going to fight, where we're going to fight, with whom we're going to fight, and, uh, and with what we're going to fight. But in many ways, we haven't addressed in climate security the biggest question of why we'd fight. So the British Prime Minister spoke to the UN Security Council on the 23rd of February, and in this he posed a really interesting question. He said, listen, can you take the right to protect, the R2P, the responsibilities that we have to protect, can you extend that to part of the idea about climate security? And maybe we want to get back to that in questions in itself. But listen, we have a really difficult set of uh, challenges and intellectual problems to uh, hit up on in the next period. So we've got a rock star panel for you joining us or in person, uh, uh, in person or electronically. First up, we'll have uh, Dr. Lester Grau. Lester is a soldier scholar, a Russian expert, 52 years in the uh, US Army, uh, a combat experience ranging from Vietnam through Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, He's written 18 books, 250 articles. His latest e-book is on the Russian way of war. Uh, a really good, we'll hear from him first. Then we're going to get to Lieutenant General Alphonse Mace, Chief of the German Army, aviator by background, S4, K4. I mean, you name it, all those big European operations that were there, he's been in it. He's also been in the EU Capability Group. So we have a really interesting facet there. Two tours in Afghanistan, command tours before that, and got to his current position as chief of the German army in February uh, 2020. So has experienced nearly all of that in some kind of lockdown, but through a pandemic. Thirdly, uh, and to my left in person, we've got Elsa Kania, an adjunct senior fellow from the Center of New American Studies. Her focus is on Chinese military strategy, defense innovation, and emerging technology. Elsa is a bit of a powerhouse. Uh, I did a podcast episode with her last week, which has elicited a great deal of uh, praise and interest from loads of people. We're very lucky to have her because Elsa is just at the crucial moments of finishing her first book, which is due out next spring. Uh, and so we're very lucky to be able to break her away from that 
uh, maybe it will help. And then to finish us off, we have a good friend of Rusi, Lieutenant General uh, Sir Ed uh, Smith Osborne, lifeguards from 83, West Germany to Afghanistan. Again, a bit like Leicester, he's experienced the whole Cold War through to new wars and then perhaps a change back again. There's this experience that is broader than just COIN and CT. Uh, he's commanded at every level, pretty much every operation the UK has been involved in. The current commander of HQ Arc, and HQ Arc, I know Ed might touch on this, but there was a recent RUSI AUSA report on the core level of command, which highlighted both in uh, British and America thinking eyes that HQ Arc was the was the hallmark, was the best place where core thinking and evolution of command was occurring. So it's uh, great to have Ed with us today. Now, each of the speakers is going to get 10 minutes, uh, a maximum of 10 minutes, otherwise I'll be interrupting them. All that's on the record. We'll hear one after the other. And then we're going to go into Q&A, which is all off the record, with a hard stop time of 13.30, so we can all go and grab some lunch. Questions by Slido. Uh, do send them in. Uh, we'll get them here and get through as many as we can. And in the room, the two microphones, as we've done before. So, without further ado, Lester, over to you. Thank you very much. It's um, a pleasure, uh, Professor Roberts, to be here. I appreciate Rusi's kind invitation to attend. Um, first slide, please. The slide shows the uh, cover of the Russian Way of War, the back, back one, please, <clears throat> which is available um, as a free download. It's been out, uh, Dr. Martels and I wrote it about three years ago. In it, we discuss the, uh, the, the Russian uh, modernization, uh, force structure and tactics. And one of the things, just to get us off to the right start, uh, Russian Motorized Rifle Brigade has four maneuver battalions, three motorized rifle, one tank, four artillery battalions, uh, two howitzer, one MLR, uh, one anti-tank, two air defense battalions, a engineer battalion, uh, signal battalion, uh, support and maintenance, and a radio electronic uh, warfare company. So uh, it's, it's a small but uh, rather lethal organization. Uh, and if you notice, there's a great emphasis on artillery. The Russians have always been big on artillery. I've always accused them of being a, uh, an artillery army with, uh, with a, uh, a fair share of tanks. And I, I think that's, that's a fair thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide, please. Um, back one, <laughs> I'm messing it up. But uh, what I'd like to talk about is the Russians have long been involved in mass fires. They haven't gotten away from it, but they're also trying to get into the precision fire business uh, as we have. And during the Soviet area, they were very concerned with the ability to detect uh, and destroy uh, high value targets in a short period of time. And they developed the reconnaissance fire complex, which was the tactical level uh, reconnaissance uh, complex, and the reconnaissance strike complex, which was operational using more uh, long range aviation, uh, uh, rockets, glickums, uh, this sort of thing. But the idea is to take the target out quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Ground Forces Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief of Reconnaissance, uh, General Mayor Vadim Marushin, has said basically today the cycle reconnaissance engagement takes literally 10 seconds. And this is what they've been trying to get down to detect and destroy uh, in a minimum amount of time because your high value targets are going to be mobile. And if you don't uh, take them under fire quickly, you're going to lose them. So they've developed the reconnaissance fire system and the reconnaissance strike system, the tactical and the operational level. And the problem initially was the uh, area in between where both uh, tactical and operational weapons can engage 
and who determines if it's high value and who engages it. Uh, they've worked this out through a common target system um, and uh, uh, trying to get this uh, under, under control so they don't uh, double target and double engage high value targets. And now they're moving down to a, a new system called the VROC. This is still very experimental, but this is low level tactile uh, targets because high value targets for a battalion may be quite different than uh, high value targets for a uh, for an army. Uh, next slide, please. And this is how you do it. Uh, so you have reconnaissance systems such as UAVs, uh, uh, aircraft, spotter planes, radar, uh, out there searching the battlefield, detecting targets, uh, transmitting the, the, the data back into uh, the various uh, headquarters, uh, command, command posts, uh, artillery uh, posts, and then engaging the targets directly with, uh, with precision weapons often. But in many cases, conventional artillery will do the job. Uh, you just need to put a few more rounds on it to make sure that you've got it. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, the, this is the heart of the system, the strelitz, which is uh, now widely distributed throughout the, uh, the Russian forces, and it is at all levels, and basically it and enables you to implement this reconnaissance fire system. It's not just a computer. Uh, it's, it's communications, it's uh, co computation, it's mapping, it uh, can handle tactical and operational fires, it uh, meshes well with uh, the other domains, uh, they're, they're on, on common radio uh, traffic, and it, so it will integrate your operators, your assets, your command elements, your vehicles, your fire systems to include ground-based tube artillery, rocket artillery, ballistic cruise missiles, strike aviation, ship and coastal fires. And the goal and what they claim is the reality is they can do it in 10 seconds. Uh, now, at 10 seconds, um, is detect and the fire's on the way, obviously, but uh, that if, if you can do it, that, that's pretty impressive. So basically one of the areas that they've gone into deeply on the artillery is, uh, is this area. And you, you they put a lot of time and effort into it. They have not neglected the conventional uh, artillery systems. They've got some new systems coming out. Uh, one of them right now is the Coalitia. The Coalitia is a 152. Originally, it was going to be in brigade artillery, but now it looks like it's going to be in, arm, in the uh, artillery brigades. But it basically, it has an unmanned turret and the capability for remote uh, operation. Uh, so it, with the unmanned turret, it can carry fewer rounds. They've been into robot uh, for quite a while. The uh, T-62 tank was the last tank that had a four-man crew and a, and a loader. They went to the auto loader uh, and uh, the original ones weren't very good, but uh, they, they've certainly improved. And they are now moving in this into the artillery system. So as we look to the future, one of the things is if it can be detected, uh, it, it better be moving or it better be able to, uh, in, to use uh, countermeasures. And I'm running right at my time level, so I'll stop right there. Thank you. Lester, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting in terms of comparison. Everyone seems to be developing uh, these sort of mobile strike 
fires complexes, and we just need to figure out uh, what that looks like. Indeed, we've already got a question on it. Uh, so, without further ado, let's turn to uh, Lieutenant General Mace. Sir, welcome. Yeah, welcome, Peter. Is every, am I understandable? Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for inviting me, and it, it's really an absolute pleasure for me as a chief of the German Army to have the first time the opportunity to speak in such a, a really distinct um, audience, which only can Uzi put together in Europe. And, and up front, please let me um, apologize that it was not able that I attend uh, in person because national um, COVID regulations prevented me from traveling to London today. Yeah, thanks again for this kind um, introduction um, you gave to me and uh, jumping to the subject you gave me, um, I would like to, to point out that I just read a short summary of the CGS um, um, keynote and I, I really can um, underline everything he said and the, the main messages I, I totally share. Uh, what I would like to do is to, to add a little bit a German perspective on it and, uh, and looking into the future, it's always um, a good approach to identify from, from where we are coming. And uh, from, from my perspective, there's a one date, uh, it's, it's only two weeks ago, um, where we had here a date in, in Germany, of, at least for the German armed forces, um, where two things happened, happened which, which changed a little bit the grid reference, uh, the coordinate system um, for our armed forces. And that was the, the official and the formal beginning of the redeployment from Afghanistan. And, uh, and then the same day, my, uh, my Minister of Defense and our CHOT um, published a, a key point paper um, indicating the, the way ahead for the, for the German armed forces. And um, being now in, in command of the German army for 15 months, I have to admit that most of the force I command is, is still oriented and organized um, on stabilization operations. So sustaining and mainta maintaining um, contingents for Afghanistan and Mali and uh, in an unlimited time manner is, is, is still the key task. And uh, in a certain way, um, the principles which, uh, which um, underpin this organization is, is more um, efficiency, is, is more important than effectiveness. Um, centralization of resources is, is, is more important than decentralization and uh, giving unit commanders everything they have. Um, Predictability of um, of operations um, of choice um, are, have have different uh, requirements than uh, than cold start capabilities or readiness um, initiatives, and and uh, and on the other hand, functional stovepipe oriented processes are, are more important than than cohesive, well trained, well equipped larger formations which are able to fulfill high intensity warfare, and and, and on top of it. Force planning along a tailor to the mission operational requirement set is, um, is the, the driving planning principle. And, and all those things we have to overcome. And, uh, and the mentioned key point paper um, of my leadership is now indicating this turn. To a certain degree, we have already overcome it in the last few years um, to make um, EFP and VJTF cycles possible. But even EFP and VJTF are following a very, how shall I say, a strict planning timeline, are predictable, and the units know when, when it will be their turn. And uh, so these are... These are not the prerequisites or the assumptions uh, we can um, base on in our future planning. The shift in the guiding principle is, is now, as I said, um, um, overturned in this key point paper. And, uh, and, and the longest way to go will have the land force. And it was already indicated by this uh, short introduction remark of uh, Mr. Roberts, because um, for land forces, um, or shall I say, their, their mass and their organization in different echelons, they have totally different requirements than Navy or Air Force, which are more platform oriented and are more in a force provider attitude um, than the land forces will ever be. And uh, what we have to overcome from my perspective, and that's really a hard fight for me in, in Berlin and uh, discussing with politicians, um, is to, that we have to overcome the, the definition of land forces as a toolbox. 
where you can open the toolbox and uh, dig in and take the one tool or the one knife or this screwdriver or this hammer and put it together and send it to Afghanistan or, or Mali or wherever um, to participate in a multinational stabilization operation and where participating is a military political value in itself. And uh, to make understandable, especially the political leadership, that land forces are, are in a an, in an high intensity scenario, are um, uh, generating their, their, their capabilities and their performance is, is in, in larger formations, which are well trained, well equipped, um, coherent, uh, put together, trained and organized as we intend to fight. And uh, this is in, at least in Germany, it's really a mental change in, uh, in, in our political and military leadership, which we have to achieve. Yeah, to achieve this, the German army is, is moving forward on, on two axes. I would like to mention the first axis is, and, and that's indicating how big the gap is we have created in, in recent uh, 20 years, um, is re-establishing a traditional, I would call it probably legacy war fighting capability. Um, and we, when we indicated in, in one heavy armored division with three brigades, capable of integrating brigades of allies if required. And the buzzword for this in, in our terms is the so-called Division 2027, um, where, we, where we would like to or where we intend to achieve um, or regain a basic warfighting function, um, which we have lost over time, for which we have, I think, the material on hand or at least in a, in a, in a short notice pipeline. So with um, approximately 350 fighting vehicles of type of Puma and uh, 350 uh, um, Leopard um, main battle tanks. Um, I think we have the core for this and uh, 100 howitzers, set propelled howitzers, Panzer Haubitze 2000. So we have the, the firepower is available. What's missing and why we have to, to, to get better and get faster is re-establishing the, the divisional, the, the division troops level, um, um, white water gap bridging, um, um, long range fire. I will come back to this in a, in a few seconds. So this is, but this is the one axis we are moving forward is um, reestablishing war fighting. The second axis, it's, it's starting in parallel, but with an implementation horizon a little bit further into the future is, uh, is heading towards a force capable of dealing with conflict types of the, of the next decade realizing full digitization, implementing new technologies and picking up new trends. Um, in order to achieve this, we have created or we are in the, in the process of creating test and uh, experimental units um, where we try to bring in new technology and to, to, to influence um, the way of procurement and capability planning um, from, from a land perspective from the very beginning, not leaving it to to engineers or to conceptualists, but uh, but having always the practical side um, on board from the very beginning. Are both axes completely separated? Absolutely not. On the one hand, we want um, the first axis um, to, to benefit as much as possible from, from our findings in the, the second. And, uh, and, uh, and on the other hand, we cannot start the second axis from a, from a white sheet of paper we, we can start this process only along the structures we have and recognize it, recognizing that we are still tight in stabilization operations, especially in Africa. Having in mind those two axes of advance, and um, I'm coming to the end of my statement, um, what are the main challenges we are facing at the short end of, of this process? So the, first, um, the first issue we are dealing with, and I, I've read all the, the relevant papers um, um, of your MOD and, um, and armed forces, which came out recently, and I had already a, a VTC with um, CGS on that some, some weeks ago. Um, the first question which drives me currently is the question of how to rebalance high intensity and step up requirements um, sound um, to answer yeah, the question: what, Which is the right force? What is the right force mix, and uh, which is most suitable to to cover both? You know, the, the most dangerous scenario, which is Article Five in within NATO, and and on the other hand, the most likely scenario. Um, already um, ongoing scenarios we we still have to feed in, in stabilization operations. 
questions. And how can we generate a continuum of forces to give politicians all options? And uh, I think this um, threefold um, approach for, for, on the one hand, light air mobile, medium forces and heavy forces in, in the right mix and in the right um, um, different um, readiness states is, is the answer we, we have to find and to define. Um, second um, important question is, where are our limits, um, capability gaps, shortfalls and deficiencies for high intensity warfare especially? Because here we have the, the biggest um, in, in from the biggest, sorry for that, we have the biggest gaps. And um, long range fire, counter UAS, CIS modernization and digitization, logistical sustainability of large formations are, are key questions. And uh, I think we have, we have everything in the pipeline. Programs are already available, but what we don't have any longer is time. And uh, so the basic question is, how can we accelerate running programs? Um, how can we um, overcome gaps in multinational cooperation and uh, probably support each other in, uh, in, uh, in our efforts? And, um, and to make some progress here. And uh, yeah, the third question I would like to, to, or the third challenge I think we are really digging in at the moment is how to make best use of digitization. Because from my perspective, digitization is not a value in itself, especially in the military context, as it reduces our resilience. Um, it, we have to, to define digitization and develop digitization in order to gain some advantage in terms of speed, precision, or connectivity, um, because uh, digitization comes with a price. Yeah, these are probably the, the issues I would like to mention here in this context, and probably we can pick up the one or the other in, in our discussion. And uh, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Back to you. Alphonse, thank you very much indeed. Uh, really, I, I was struck by four or five things that came out there, not least your challenges. But, you know, that line that land forces cannot be seen as a toolbox uh, across the sort of defence and security spectrum is really important. I think it touches on what some uh, uh, people said. The second point I thought was your emphasis on faster is, is a recurring theme that we get from lots of people, this idea of speed, and you touched on it in one of your challenges as well about how to accelerate. I th hope that there will be some questions coming in on that because I think this obsession with speed is something we might want to dig into and contrast quite nicely with our next speaker, uh, Elsa. I'll give her, uh, over to her in a second. But the other point that really struck me was about the T&E. How do you know that it's going to work, all this new stuff that you've got, which requires, as you say, the best baseline data, because otherwise all your models are merely confirmation bias, which isn't necessarily helpful. There's loads to get into there, including the stuff that we didn't get into on capability gaps and shortfalls for high intensity, like logs and CBRN, which you know, has yet to be covered. And then, of course, there's the ubiquitous digitization question at the end. So lots to get into. But in the meantime, let's go over to... Uh, Elsa, and let's cover, uh, hear what she's got to say. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks to the whole Rusi team. I'm very happy to be here, and, uh, and certainly uh, ho hope you all are well, safe, and staying healthy, whether you're here in person or joining us online. The past year has certainly been tumultuous, and as I provide uh, an American perspective on China's strategic thinking, on future warfare, and the operational environment, perhaps I'll start with the assessment that the Chinese Communist Party often uses when they discuss these times, the notion that Xi Jinping had initially articulated in 2018 that we are in a moment of profound changes unseen in a century. And this concept evokes not only uh, what is seen from Beijing's view to be the historical inevitability of China's rise relative to the West's decline, but also the progression of a new industrial revolution that is also believed to be causing a revolution in military affairs in the process. And certainly the impact of the pandemic, as we've seen over the past year, is also an element of these profound changes and one that I think ought uh, to provoke all, all of us uh, within any military or any country to continue to grapple with what, uh, what security truly means and how we think about uh, much more complex and systemic threats going forward. So I'll start, uh, I guess, with reflecting on the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, and its aspiration to become a world-class military or a global first-tier military. 
And there is still some debate on the question as to whether that uh, is intended to imply a military that is on par with the U.S. military or one that perhaps has already surpassed and, and exceeded U.S. military power, at least on some fronts. And I would argue the latter, in fact, for reasons I'll elaborate, especially when it comes to new domains and new frontiers of military power in which uh, the traditional American advantage, whether technological or operational, is challenged. And I think this raises questions for all of us as to what would it mean to be in a future fight without that sort of advantage or superiority that we have enjoyed in recent history. And when we talk today, uh, such as in discourse on American strategy about a new era of great power rivalry or great power competition, or GPC as it's sometimes abbreviated, I would tend to reject that premise in some respects, including because I don't believe this is a new era in quite that manner. If we look at the trajectory of Chinese military modernization and the the uh, scope uh, over the decades, I would argue that for for the CCP and for the PLA, uh, their current course we can trace back to the to the 1990s, to the PLA's reaction to the Gulf War, to the Taiwan Straits crisis, to the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, which is still believed to be a, to have been a deliberate attack in character and. Certainly, this had provoked changes in Chinese military strategy at the time to focus on high-tech warfare and attention to the notion of a revolution in military affairs catalyzed by information technology. And there's been relative consistency in the years since, since uh, in this vision of future warfare and in the PLA's concentration on the U.S. military as a powerful adversary as both a model or template and a target for its, for its efforts. And we've seen a focus on asymmetric development, whether that is cyber forces, ballistic missiles, the idea of having uh, trump card weapons, uh, what, whatever the enemy is fearful of, that is, which, that is what we must be developing, as uh, Jiang Zemin had claimed at the time. And I think we can see, we can start to see the outcomes of this approach, uh, whether on parade through Tiananmen Square or in some of the, some of the exercises that have been underway. And, and I think in particular, beyond uh, the conventional, and I'll focus less on my remarks on land warfare and more on some of these new domains and frontiers with which uh, every service uh, m must grapple and which are uh, in increasingly uh, blending across uh, and perhaps creating fusion of domains, as the PLA phrases it. I think in particular, a focus of much of my research has been understanding the impacts of some of the Chinese military reforms that we've seen play out over the past half decade and the, their priorities in development and what that says about uh, what future warfare may involve, given that the PLA aspires not just to keep pace, but also to be poised to design future warfare, to have developed the capabilities that will define the parameters of the operating environment. And certainly a priority o over the past couple of years has been the development of the PLA Strategic Support Force, which uh, is arguably the tip of the spear for future Chinese military power and arguably a force unique in its structure in the world given the functional integration of space, cyber, electronic, and psychological warfare capabilities as well as a mandate for these testing and experimentation with new technologies. We've seen uh, immense enthusiasm for drones, for unmanned and, and increasingly autonomous systems across all domains of warfare and uh, with an uh, interest as to uh, not just uh, notions of human-machine teaming, but human-machine integration and, and certainly uh, a, an increased uh, emphasis on innovation is not just a characteristic of Chinese military strategy, but I would argue a feature of China's grand strategy as a rising power that is trying to pursue an innovation-driven approach to development across the board. And again, this has been consistent across uh, successive generations of Chinese leadership, but these ambitions have come in, into focus in particular under Xi Jinping and what he would term a new era uh, in his own right, and one in which we've seen an emphasis on innovation as driving and enabling China's rise as a great power that is, in its eyes, returning to a, to a rightful position. And I think an important uh, 
Uh, well, I would argue that economics are the f- foundation and fundamentals of this competition. Uh, China's, the strength of China's economy also creates a foundation for sustaining and enabling military power through a national strategy of military civil fusion that seeks to create synergies and enable increased integration in Chinese uh, d- scientific and technological development, whether that is in talent or sharing of resources or capacity for mobilization such as we saw exercised in peacetime in China's response, including its military response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think going forward, the, this, uh, the intersection of these strategies and the folk and uh, impact of military civil fusion will particularly come into play when it comes to emerging technologies, whether that is artificial intelligence, which has been a key priority for China's leaders as a strategic technology, or quantum technology, biotechnology, and the intersections among these technologies going forward. And we've heard quite a bit this morning about uh, digitization as a focus for Western militaries, uh, a parallel or perhaps a distinct concept that has come to guide Chinese military modernization as a matter of of strategy and priority is uh, the idea of intelligentization that uh, we're seeing underway. Again, this revolution in military affairs in the PLA's eyes, and PLA is in a unique position as a military once backwards, now uh, then trying to catch up, and now seeking to lead in undertaking the fused or integrated development of mechanization informatization and intelligentization, looking not only at today's informatized warfare in which information is critical to military power, but towards future intelligent warfare in which uh, without data you can't fight. And data is integral to having an algorithmic advantage and ultimately an advantage in cognition and decision making. So I think going forward, it will be fascinating to watch how the PLA and its drive for innovation in its own right will continue to progress on these fronts and some of the perhaps unique features of its, uh, of its quest to become a world-class military and some of, the, some of the experimentation we're already seeing happening during peacetime, whether that's contests and competitions to develop uh, AI systems in a wargaming environment to uh, uh, undertake a contingency such as a Taiwan invasion of complex drone operations, whether it is uh, experimentation with brain-computer interfaces and the idea of having a more integrated approach to command and control that might uh, could notionally involve human enhancement, the idea that the human, the warfighter, must uh, have to keep pace with increased tempo and speed of operations. And although the human element remains critical, I think all of us would admit, and uh, Chinese military strategists emphasize as well, I think we are seeing, again, this uh, a, a, a degree of technological determinism and how the Chinese military talks about the impact of these technologies and capabilities, which, uh, and often, often Engels is quoted in this context, which will, whether the commander wills it or not, uh, once developed will inevitably be uh, deployed and employed on the future battlefield. So I think going forward, I would say in closing that uh, I think we're at a moment where we have to continue to grapple as nations uh, within, uh, within our alliances and partnerships with the impact of China's rise, uh, not only strategically, but also militarily going forward. And I think looking at the, the features and the unique elements of how the PLA is thinking about and preparing for future warfare, I think uh, can be both, both troubling and also can perhaps provoke some uh, more creative thinking and uh, and thinking perhaps more asymmetrically in our parts as well going forward. And ultimately, although I am concerned about the current trajectory of, uh, of these rivalries, I believe that great powers also have great agency in, ha- in w- how we choose to conduct ourselves in peacetime and in any future conflict. And I hope that there also are measures uh, by which we can continue dialogue and engagement at multiple levels about the that the ethical and operational and geostrategic implications of these technologies given, given the multiple, uh, m- multiple challenges ahead. So never a dull moment working on or trying to make sense of these issues. And I will very much look forward to continuing the conversation. Elsa, thank you very much. I, I think there is something about the language of the PLA modernization that is reflected in lots of Western literature and narratives about how we talk about what we want to do and I hope in questions we get to some of the reality because you know, there's, there's every risk that we could build them up into something that they're not they've done their reorganization they're trying to modernize the, you know they're a huge force but you know 
because they've been talking about it for so long, I hope we get to a question which says, yeah, so what? Are they actually that good? Because uh, I, I think we can say that same for the Russian forces. But our final speaker, Ed, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. Um, I, I thought I would say a little about the task of delivering a timely core-level warfighting capability in response to the sort of challenges that we've heard about this morning and that from where we sit in Innsworth, we believe that our adversaries might field today. My locus for, for so doing is our mandate uh, as NATO's first warfighting corps headquarters held at Redness since the end of the Cold War. Now, you hardly need me to say that the, the challenge is significant, not least because it is opaque. There is a sense to me of back to the future about it, but with an important difference. Our predecessors faced off a clearly defined and unambiguous threat that on land might have been characterized by panzers and bayonets crossing international borders, that triggering the oft-quoted Article 5. Today, we have an alliance that's grown from the original 12 apostles through 15 at the end of the Cold War to 30 today, that interestingly is once again threat rather than capability based, but focused on a continuum of competition through crisis into conflict, where many of the threats to our nations and way of life are tricky to identify, attribute and evidence. It's, a, it's an approach which I would suggest demands a broader understanding of conflict in all its forms and the uses of probably both Article 3 and 4, but particularly 4, to safeguard the territorial integrity, political independence, and our security in its wider sense, both of our nation and that of our allies. And it is perhaps through such preparedness that we enable readiness and catalyze decision-making at a tempo that underpins relevance. In other words, this is not all about a difficult Article 5 to see and to act upon. It's about taking decisions much earlier. Put another way, if not forward early in sufficient strength and with the appropriate capability to deter, we shall likely be faced by an altogether more difficult task of reclamation and perceived escalation, with all that means for force structures resilient for offensive operations. Now, it's here that I think the model of liminal warfare, so clearly articulated by Kilcullen in his book, Dragons and Snakes, is instructive. And it's a useful mechanism, I would suggest, for setting out the political military challenge. His graph set, as many of you will know only too well, against overt, ambiguous, covert and clandestine detection thresholds places a premium on competition and, by that token, the ability to shape the operational environment lest we be placed at a competitive disadvantage which was exactly the point that General Scaparotti made in his strategic thoughts several years ago. The cost of not doing so being ambiguity at the moment critique, delay in decision-making and consensus, and the likely failure of deterrence. And of note, he posits a comparatively short mission window de-escalating in order to transfer responsibility of re-escalation onto the alliance. Successful deterrence is therefore not only about maintaining sensitized INW indicators and retaining the ability to act at the speed of relevance, 
but also about conscience and mitigation of one's own political, diplomatic, geographic and domain boundaries. Now, it is of course our fundamental purpose to deter rather than fight a war. So I would like now to touch on the relationship between the hard capabilities of war fighting and their latent ability to influence the psychology of deterrence. First and foremost, we are nothing without insight. An informed and demonstrable resolve and a credible posture. Secondly, we must value the benefits of a multinational alliance. In this context, it is about the unique insights and breadth of perspective allies bring, so vividly evident to me on my travels throughout the Baltic and the Black Sea region. Let us take current activity as an example whereby we can cohere national and alliance activity into a unitary and singular message. Exercise Defender 21, in progress now, is that example of demonstrable and steadfast resolve. A plethora of separate but linked exercises orchestrated across the region with a common aim to reassure allies and de deter adversarial trespass, backed by the creation of a new core headquarters in the Carpathians and the re-emergence of Five Corps from hibernation, and underpinned by the transformation from the industrial to the information age so clearly articulated earlier this morning. And it is this approach that we must develop in the face of the scale of the Russian Federation mobilization and exercise program, most recently and visibly illustrated on the borders of Ukraine and currently in preparation in Western Military District for Kavkaz 21. Now, credible posture is vital to any compelling message of deterrence and, by that token, a springboard for defence. Emerging technology, particularly in terms of long-range fires, the all-embracing nature of cyber and electromagnetic activities, and the universal nature of space, are changing the character of battlefield geometry at the core level beyond recognition. Take for a moment the challenge of hypersonic missile technology and extended range rocket and cannon artillery, integrated with adroit cyber collect and space ISR, designed and trained to enable a recce strike complex. And you catalyze a completely different approach to fielding an order of battle in terms of dispersion, electronic and physical camouflage, and the ability to mass capability for decisive effect. It certainly places an absolute premium on the deep. It probably means that anything close is only viable after the destruction of an adversarial recce strike capability, and it brings the traditional view of rear into the whole question of a 360 degree battle. And I would suggest it probably also means that we should not be hidebound about whether we fire to maneuver or whether we maneuver to fire. And that simple change may bring a not insignificant change to our force structure. So how might we accrue a warfighting advantage against an asymmetric peer. I think it worth focusing the lens on four potentially symbiotic areas. Tempo, combined operations, the new domains, and experimentation. 
First, we need to focus on the tempo of decision-making and action. The thorough nature of our process risks irrelevance when set against a directive decision-making model, opaque thresholds for action, and a different approach to risk. That said, Mission Command confers an advantage when off-plan compared against a directive reset. So it is to strategic decision-making, orchestration of competition to avoid disadvantage, and tactical interoperability that I would concentrate effort. Secondly, multinational force generation has a compound benefit beyond the mere sum of its component parts in terms of capability and mass alongside the self-evident economies of scale and the potential to remove the friction of borders, that, of course, speaking to tempo. Thirdly, multi-domain operations confers two specific and highly relevant advantages, quite aside from taking advantage of emerging technologies and harnessing the logical extension of combined arms tactics and joint operations. It speaks to mass reduction and the ability to write down the recce strike complex, the pacing threat for a warfighting corps today. Ultimately, as Christian Brose would say, sensors and shooters will need to be agnostic of service and nation. And this is an area that we must close with if we are to realize the opportunities implicit with such geometrical change. Fourthly, we need to place a premium on experimentation to keep up, to transform, to modernize. Let me give you one example from 18 ongoing capability development and experimentation projects in the ARC today. We are working with an AI provider to examine the structural, doctrinal, and cultural impact of software on decision-making in order to improve the tempo of our decision-making and the consequent lethality of our actions. So two particular, two specific outputs. The initial experimentation on our recent core planning process, which we had already halved in time from the established and accepted doctrinal norm, showed the ability to reduce estimate timelines further and ease operational staff writing production significantly. This is an area where we can gain time. Let me leave you with one further thought. If you accept my assertion that we need to be forward in sufficient strength to deter and by that token defend, should the need arise, there seems to me to be little alternative to regionalization, enabled on an enduring and allied basis, the resourcing of which is informed by the threat. That structure and it is provided today by multinational core northeast in Stechin and the nascent multinational core southeast, currently in Bucharest, shortly to move to Sibiu. That structure has to be backed by a suitably equipped and enabled second echelon, with all the implications for readiness, ore batting, and equipment that involves, its viability being defined by its utility. And that I would offer is where the ARC aspires to sit today. Thank you very much.